Thank you, worship team, for leading us. Jake, I invite you all to open your Bibles to John chapter 16. And as you're turning there, let me pray for this moment of study of God's word. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you would speak through me in the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, and may this book live. May it live in our hearts and in our minds, and may we obey its truth. In Christ's name, amen. I want you to look at verse 16, and I'm going to read to the end of the chapter, beginning in verse 16. A little while longer, and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while, and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, what is this that he says to us, a little while, and you will not see me? And again, a little while, and you will see me, and because I am going to the Father. So they were saying, what does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he is talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, is this what you are asking yourselves, what I meant by saying, a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come, but when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. In that day, you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive that your joy may be full. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when, when, I, when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day, you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father." His disciples said, ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered each to his own home and will leave me alone, yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Now when I first read this section of scripture this week, I must admit that I didn't know exactly what to do with it because there's so many facets and there's so many intricacies to it. And I was driving on Monday night. I was driving south on I-95 and the, this passage hit me with an electric shock. It was like it just crystallized in my mind and everything just came together. You know how it is when you're meditating on the word of God and then the Holy Spirit just makes things clear. And this statement came to my mind that this passage reveals the story arc of forever. The story arc of forever forever. What does that mean? Well, let me explain the context a little bit. The disciples are filled with pain, sorrow. 
uh, they're dejected. Look at verse six. Jesus says, because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. And then look at verse 20. Again, he says, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful. That word for sorrow, the same word in both verses, it means pain of mind or spirit. Affliction of the mind. Have you ever had something that was so sad or so overwhelming, it was like a splinter in your brain? And you try to do things to get away from it, but nothing you can do can erase the reality of the sorrow and the grief that's there. Maybe if you've lost a a, a kid, you know what I'm talking about, or you've lost a spouse, you know what I'm talking about that that pain and that anguish is present even though you don't want it to be there. And even in the moments that you're having fun or whatever you're doing, it's still there. And you can't get rid of it. And Jesus is saying here to his disciples, he's addressing them, he doesn't want them to have that sorrow. He doesn't want them to have that grief. And quite frankly, he doesn't want us to walk in that sorrow. Christ desires that we walk in joy, not in sorrow. But what's fascinating is Jesus doesn't remove the sorrow from the disciples by saying, I'm going to change the situation. He doesn't do that. I know we often want him to do that. Lord, just change the situation Jesus says, I'm going to to help you in your sorrow by giving you perspective regarding the situation. You see, so much about the Christian life is simply a matter of perspective. That you see what's going on in light of the big picture. And that's how Jesus often works is he doesn't change the circumstances, he gives you clarity in the midst of the circumstances so you can understand what is taking place. Our problem is, this is, this is one of the, 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 the great problems, is that we don't live our lives in light of the biblical story. We forget the biblical, God-centered perspective that we should live with. The disciples, they wanted the story arc from here to be flat, the gravy train. You know, Jesus, at this point, are you going to restore the kingdom? You're going to restore the kingdom. You're going to defeat our enemies. You're going to give us the food. You know, it's all going to be good. It's going to be a flat trajectory. And I think oftentimes that's what we want, isn't it? Lord, give me the, give me the blessed life. No problems, no pain, no trials, no tribulations. Give me that flat, smooth surface. I'll just ride my bike along and it'll be, it'll be good. But Jesus says, no, 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 no. Look, for it to work the way it's supposed to, there's gonna be a big dip. There's gonna be a big dip. What am I talking about? The crucifixion. Literally, I'm going into the ground. And then there's gonna be a V up. I'm coming out of the tomb. And then I'm gonna be with you. And then it's not just gonna be flat, then I'm going up to the Father. So part of what you need to understand, Jesus says, in the midst of your problem are the acts of the story of redemption. So what Jesus does is he teaches his disciples to deal with sorrow by understanding 
the major acts of redemptive history. And in so doing, we can learn also how to deal with our sorrows and tribulations. So here is act one. Act one, Jesus explains Christ's redemption, his redemption, which ultimately leads to our joy. Look at verse 16. Jesus uses this little statement. He says, a little while, and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while, and you will see me. So this is somewhat cryptic, but clearly on on our side of the resurrection, we know what he's talking about. A little while, and you will see me no longer. That refers to his death. At that point, you will no longer see me, literally for three days. And again, a little while, and you will see me. He will be raised from the dead, and then the disciples will see him. And commentators debate that the meaning of that last phrase, again, you will see me, commentators debate, is he talking about after the resurrection when he appears to his disciples? Is he talking about at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit comes in power and that's when his disciples will see the power of Jesus? Or is he talking about the second coming when we will see the Lord in the clouds? And the answer is what? Yes. Yes. Uh, here's one commentator, this is helpful, Westcott. He said, the, the fulfillment of this promise not must be limited to any one special event. So it's not just, he says, as the resurrection or Pentecost or the return. He said, the beginning of this new vision was at the resurrection, but its fulfillment is all of history. You will, we see Christ in the spirit and we'll see him again when he returns, so on and so forth. Verse 17, So some of his disciples said to one another, what is this that he says to us? A little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. And because I'm going to the Father. The disciples still do not understand this reality of crucifixion. Has Jesus told them about the crucifixion? Yes, he has. Yes, he has. If you read the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you remember he's pulled them aside and he's told them on multiple occasions that he is going to Jerusalem and will be crucified. For example, let me give you this cross-reference, Matthew 16, 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. So he's told them explicitly what will happen. The problem is, is they are so focused on what they think Jesus will do in terms of restoring the kingdom, they have, had, they have not had ears to hear. And so they do not have the categories to understand what Jesus is saying by a little while. And that's in verse 18. So they were saying, what does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he is talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him. And that phrase, ask him, means to question him. They they wanted to, to not just ask him one or two questions, but they wanted to dive deep and figure this out. So he said to them, Is this what you are asking yourselves? What I meant by saying a little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while you will see me. So Jesus knows, question, how does Jesus know what they wanted to ask him about? Answer, he's the son of God. Omniscience, divine omniscience. He knows, remember John 2, Jesus knew what was in man, that their deeds were evil. Jesus exercised divine omniscience at different points throughout his ministry. Jesus responds, verse 20, amen, amen, truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn in to joy. Now, wait a second. I thought, Jesus, that you were trying to comfort me. I thought that you were trying to bring peace and help me in my situation. Remember, why are they sorrowful? 
Because Jesus has said, I'm going away. But what Jesus says here, not just that I'm going away, things are about to get worse. Things are about to get real bad in this situation. And you are sorrowful now, but you will, future tense, weep and lament. And the world, and, by, and, and world here is a loaded term. World in John's gospel can mean the evil world. The evil world, not just neutral people, but, but the world and in, in its totality of evil. And he says, that world will rejoice. The, the evil world will think that they've won. Remember in Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, when Aslan is killed, and it's like all those demonic goblins are rejoicing. I mean, th- there's, that, that, there's that pit in your gut that just hates, you hate to see evil seem to triumph. And Jesus says, that's how dark it's gonna get. There's gonna be that moment in time where you think that evil's going to win the day. And you're gonna weep and lament, and it's not just that you're gonna weep and lament, but the evil world is gonna rejoice. But then your weeping and your sorrow will turn into joy. How? Well, he gives us an illustration. And if you're a woman, you understand exactly what this illustration is about, and if you're a man, we're working on it. <laughs> he says, when a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow, same word, because her hour has come. You don't control it, it comes upon you. But when she has delivered the baby, She no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. Now, as men, I don't think we can even pretend to comprehend the pain that a woman goes through in childbirth. It's the only pain that's explicitly mentioned as part of the curse, is it not, in Genesis chapter 3, that a that a that the woman is cursed with pain in childbirth. It used to be that they wouldn't even allow husbands into the delivery room. In fact, in other countries, they still some, in some places don't allow husbands into the delivery room because it is the epic pain. It is the height of pain. But here's Jesus' point. Jesus' point is not just that the joy follows the pain, even though that would be good. Jesus' point is that the joy is produced by the pain. The pain is the means to the joy. The giving of the birth is the pain that is needed to bring life into the world. The joy is the direct result of the pain. And he's saying your joy is the direct result of the cross and the resurrection. If this does not happen, you are still dead in your sins and there is no hope for eternity. And you will go to hell. So yes, it is painful now. You think that the devil has won and the forces of evil are triumphing. But by going to the grave, I'm actually defeating sin, defeating death, defeating the devil, and producing the joy that you need for all of eternity. So the pain of Christ produces the joy. The shame produces the honor. In that Philippians 2, Paul says, 
And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So what Jesus is saying is, notice that last phrase in verse 22. No one will take your joy from you. Do you believe that? We lose sight often, don't we, of the reality of what Christ has done, if you're in him. Jesus says, no one can take your joy from you. That's why Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And that's not not some sort of funny stoicism. That is genuine exhortation to joy because of what Christ has done. If we really believe the resurrection, I can't have a bad day. Here's a quote from Spurgeon. The disciples' particular sorrow was the death and absence of their Lord, and it was turned into joy when he rose from the dead and showed himself to them. Now listen to this. All the sorrow of saints will be transformed in this way. Even the worst of the sorrows that look as they must remain fountains of bitterness forever. There is no sorrow that cannot be overcome with resurrection joy and the joy of the Christian life. So what Jesus is saying is, is that your vision of the storyline is too small. You need to see what is taking place here in perspective, in light of eternity. That's act number one. Here's the second act. He says, then you need to understand what happens next. My session, Christ's session. Essentially, Christ's session is a theological term that refers to the fact that Christ is now in heaven at the right hand of God the Father, mediating and interceding for his children. Verse 23, Jesus says, in that day, you will ask nothing of me. Now, in that day refers to that period after the resurrection. And what Jesus means by this, you will ask nothing of me. He's saying at that point, you will understand this whole story that I'm trying to explain to you about the death and the resurrection and and the ascension. All of these pieces are going to fit into place and you will understand them. You, You won't need to ask me any more questions at that point. And then second part of verse 23. Here's a promise. He said, Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. So this will be the new reality of my session in heaven. Whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give to you. And this is almost a a verbatim repeat of what Jesus had told his disciples in John 14, verse 13 where he said, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Profound words. So the obvious question is, well, what does it mean to ask God in Jesus' name? What does that mean? He explains it. Look at verse, uh, chapter 15, verse 7. Turn over to chapter 15, verse 7. 
If you abide in me, that means that you walk in obedience to Christ and dependence upon Christ, and my words abide in you, that means that if you ask according to Christ's will, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. So if you're walking in fellowship to Christ and you are asking in accordance with Christ's will, Jesus says, ask whatever you want and it will be done. So summary statement, asking in Jesus' name means asking God according to the character of Jesus, according to the will of Jesus and the power of Jesus. James says, this is James 4.3, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. If, there's a, if you are not receiving the answer to the prayer that you are asking, it could be, one, that you're not walking in fellowship with God, that you're walking in disobedience, that you're not abiding in him, and two, it could be that you're not asking according to Christ's will. But Jesus says, if you do ask in my name, ask anything, and God will answer that prayer. Now, what Jesus is talking about here is not just prayer. He's not just talking about prayer. Prayer is downstream from what he's talking about. What he's talking about is fellowship with the living God. In fact, prayer is a means of fellowship with God. Just a few verses later, look at 17.3. This is eternal life that they know you, the only true God, in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Jesus is saying, look, when I'm in heaven, you are going to walk in this place of fellowship with the living God which is a direct result of my work as the mediator. I would be remiss at this point. I want you to turn over to Hebrews 10. I want to remind you just of the significance of Christ's priestly mediation. Hebrews 10, 12. Listen to these words. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be put, should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. That's his priestly work. For all time, Jesus has sanctified and perfected those for whom he died. And therefore, we walk in fellowship with God. That's Romans 5.1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have, present tense, peace with God. So you've been brought into this inner love of the Trinity through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what Christ is doing now, is the priestly work of Christ already accomplished? Yes, we are reconciled to God the Father. So in some ways, his being at the right hand of God is symbolic. It's symbolic of the fact that we don't need to make any more offerings or sacrifices. He's there, he's our mediator, but yet the work of mediation is already done. That being said, The Bible says over and over that even now, Christ is interceding for the saints. That Christ is praying for us. Look over at 17.9. I am praying for them. Talking about his children. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. Romans 8.34, Paul says, who is to condemn? 
Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. I know I say it all the time. It's one of my favorite quotes, Robert Murray McShane. If I could hear Christ praying for me in the next room, I would not fear a million enemies. But he is praying for me. So the distance makes no difference. He's praying for us. He's praying for us right now. So when you're in the trial and you're, and you're, you're experiencing the difficulty, one, remember it's all good. If the worst thing that could happen is I die and I'm gonna go to heaven and be with the Lord. But secondly, what's taking place right now? Your Lord is praying for you. I mean, you thought you were alone? You thought nobody cared? You thought only you understood the perspective? Your Lord was interceding and is interceding for you. How comforting is that? Do not be anxious for anything, but in everything through prayer and supplication, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God will comfort your heart and your mind. In who? It's not a throwaway. In Christ Jesus. He will comfort you. He prays for us. Verse 24, until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive. Look at this. That your joy may be full. Christian, there is an invitation to run into the fellowship with God. The fellowship with God is there awaiting you. And by the way, the joy I think he's talking about is not the blessing so much of answered prayer, but the blessing of being with him and knowing him and having the access to him. Verse 25, I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day, you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. What he's saying in verse 26 is don't think of Christ when you pray. Don't think that what is going on is that you're sending up a prayer to Jesus and then there's a cosmic game of telephone taking place. And then Jesus is having to say, okay, little Tommy just prayed this. I want you to answer this prayer because remember, I, I died for him. That's what Jesus is saying. He's saying you have this direct access to the Father that is immediate because remember, his priestly work is already accomplished. God is not standing there with his arms folded saying, I dare somebody to pray this prayer. The father is leaning in and he wants to answer the prayers of his children and he wants you to have joy. And it's already accomplished. That's what Jesus is saying. Look at verse 27. For the father himself loves you he loves you. He loves you. And he loves you with a special love because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. He loves you because you're one of his own. He loves you with this unique love. Jesus says in verse 28, I came from the Father and have come into the world and now I'm leaving the world and going to the Father. That's what makes this all possible. This priestly work of Christ, this mediation, it has to be there in heaven. That's what makes all of this possible. That's why the, this story arc of redemption, remember, it has that V going down, the death coming up, the resurrection, and then straight up. 
in heaven. All of this is possible by the fact that I am going away. Verse 29, his disciples said, Ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we see that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. So now they see it. They profess that, again, that Jesus is the Son of God. They profess their faith. And they say, we, we believe, we, we, we understand. Now, verse 31 is an interesting reply that Jesus makes to them. Do you now believe? Guess what's about to happen? Guess what's about to happen? Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come. It's here. The hour is here. Gethsemane is about to take place when you will be scattered each to his own home and you will leave me alone. What Jesus is saying here, I think, is that it's one thing to believe when the seas are clear. It's another thing to believe in the midst of the storm. One of the phrases that I've come to to think about quite a bit is the phrase failure of nerve. Failure of nerve. You believe something, good. What happens when the world shows up at your doorstep in opposition? Do you still hold to that? Do you still hold? Or are your nerves gonna fail? This is what happened with Margaret Thatcher when she put forward the budget People said, you, you can't do that. And, and, and everybody, the media and everybody uh, rallied against her. The other conservative people in parliament said, we got to fold. She said, have your nerves failed already? You got to have steel in your spine. It's one thing to believe. It's another thing to believe in the fire. That's what Jesus is saying. How do you believe when, you're put, when your back is put up against the wall. He says, yet, even though I will be alone, I'm not alone for the Father's with me. I enjoy this fellowship, and then you will eventually enjoy this same type of fellowship in my priestly session. So that is act two. That is act two, the fact of Christ's session in our fellowship. But there's a third act. There's a third act. I call Christ victory. Look at verse 33. I have said these things to you that in me you may have Peace. Oh, that's so good. Oh, that's so wonderful. Lord, I see it. I have the peace. You told me the story. I get it. You've told me that you will be praying for me. Praise be to God. What sweet joy. And I have this peace. Let's stop right there and go wherever we eat lunch, the Village Deli. Let's stop right there. Uh Uh-uh. No. Jesus said there's something else. Something so startling and astounding will make the hair stand up on your neck. It's not just gonna be flat for you. It's not the prosperity gospel for you. It's not just roses and buttercups for you. There's something that you need to know. Look at the second part of verse 33. In the world, you, will have tribulation. What? I, 
I thought the death, the resurrection, you in heaven, you're reigning, all my problems would disappear. I thought I would have the money, the wealth, the, the health, all of it, the friends. I thought, Jesus, that, that my story would be nice and easy now because you did it for me. Isn't that what people are selling in the bookstores right now? It's everywhere. Little books with smiling faces on the front of them. Read this book. You can look pretty like me. Ah. You know what Jesus says? Guess what? The life of your story is my story. Your life is going to look like my life. It's not going to be no flat line. You are going to have to take up your cross and follow me. And guess what? You're going to lose your life for my sake. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Your life is going to recapitulate, that's a fancy word for copy, my life. Listen to this quote from R.B. Kuyper. He said, Jesus' followers bound to have tribulation in the world. He who has none of it simply is not a true disciple. Persecution is a mark of Christianity. So, why? That's always the question I'm asking. Why? 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 Why not make it easy? First reason why. Turn over to, I didn't put this in your notes, so I wanted to catch you off guard. <laughs> Philippians 3.10. Paul says, he's talking about counting everything as loss, and he says, that I may know him, that I may know Christ, and the power of his resurrection, now look at this, and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Paul's saying that the Lord brings the trials, the tribulations, the cancer, the difficulties to make you more like him. Puritan prayer, Valley of Vision. When you lead me to the Valley of Vision, I can see you in the heights. And though my humbling wouldn't be my decision, it's here your glory shines so bright. Listen to this. So let me learn that the cross precedes the crown. To be low is to be high. That the valley is where you make me more like Christ. Don't waste your valley. You are put in the valley for the purpose of your Christ likeness. Isn't that Psalm 23? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Who put you in the valley? Answer, your shepherd. He puts you in the valley for the purpose of Christ likeness. So when you sign up for Christianity, friend, you're signing up for the narrow way. Here's your cross, come up and take it. You're signing up for Christ's life. Second reason our lives imitate Christ's life. 
that others may see Christ in us. Our lives become a walking billboard to the truth of the gospel. 2 Corinthians, turn over to 2 Corinthians now, chapter 4, verse 7. Paul says, we have this treasure in jars of clay, the treasure of the gospel, the treasure of Christ in us. Listen, to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake. Look at this. So that... That's a purpose clause. The life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. We are given over to death so that the world can see Christ's power in us and see, wow, there is something unique about that person. Christ is sustaining them, and then the gospel is on full display. So you are given over to tribulation and death so that the world could see Christ. We were at a deacon's meeting a couple months ago, and uh, we somehow started talking about tribulation and, and suffering, all these things. And somebody asked Doug Bogey about his experience with cancer. And Doug had thyroid cancer right on his neck, and eventually had to go down to MD Anderson, spend months there. And I can't remember if it was like a, a cross bracelet or, or whatever it was, but he intentionally wore an emblem of the cross. And while he was there, he said, I felt this supernatural sustainment from Christ in the prayers of the saints. And people would ask me, you know, in the midst of the chemo and every, all of it, how are you maintaining your joy. He said, I just showed him the cross. It's Christ in me. Christ's power demonstrated in me. That's the hope of glory. So our trials are present. Our tribulation is present for the purpose of testimony. That Christ be on display in us. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. So the tribulation is put there so that you would be more like Christ and so that others may see Christ in you. Last phrase. Look at verse 33. Last phrase of verse 33. Go back to John 16. But take heart. But take heart. I have what? Overcome the world. Take heart. I have overcome the world. I'm letting you go through these tribulations for a specific purpose. But take heart the end of them has been resolved already. The battle has already been won. There's already been victory. That word overcome, it's the Greek word nikeo. You know what we get from that? Nike. Nike. Victory. Spiritual victory. I have overcome the world. There's already a final outcome. Keith Green used to say, the battle has already been won. You just have to claim the victory. So there's already victory, Christian, in the face of your trial and tribulation. The world does not win. Satan does not win. Jesus wins, and we will reign with him forever. Praise be to God. It helps to understand perspective, doesn't it? 
to understand why you're facing what you're facing. But with armed with this, we can have joy in the face of any adversity, any adversity. Praise be to God. Heavenly Father, Lord, we honor you, we worship you, we, we thank you, Lord, for calling us into your kingdom, the glorious blessings of redemption, our sin being paid for, the hope of future resurrection, the reality of Christ interceding for us, and the fact that you lead us into tribulation to be more like Christ so that the world may see Christ in us. Lord, we thank you for the hope and the future promise that we will reign with you, that you are reigning now, that you are victorious over sin, death, and the devil, and that the outcome has been decided. So Lord, may we walk with joy, may we walk in peace, and may we walk in courage. May we do this all for your honor and your glory. In Christ's name, amen.